Hey everyone, Eric Hurst here. It's the last Monday of 2020. I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I was having some technical problems. I had to kind of reboot my computer and it, I think everything is working properly now. Um, I'm always trying to get the best video and best audio and the most robust wireless connection I can get in my house. And so today it was a bit of a struggle, um, but my plan today is to kind of talk about some year-end wrap-up stuff and how we can kind of set our sights on the future, uh, develop a game plan for 2021, which hopefully for all of us will be a much better year than 2020. Um, and then I'm going to be back next Monday, January 4th, and that'll be kind of a part two to this video where I'll give you some of my favorite tips for becoming more effective in your daily actions, your training, your climbing, all together kind of, you know, we'll try to paint a bit of a comprehensive picture uh, to how you can um, achieve more, be more successful in your, whether it's little things in the gym or, you know, big things in life, you know, it's all connected. And I, I'm a big fan, you know, as a, as a climber for life myself, I'm a fan that, you know, climbing is a perfect metaphor for everyday life and the things that we do to become more effective climbers, to challenge our fears uh, in the steep, to manage risk, and you know, to hopefully achieve most of our goals. The things we do in climbing, it's uh, largely the same blueprint for success in everyday life. And, you know, so it doesn't surprise me that when I run into a successful climber, you know, someone that has a track record of many years, oftentimes when I dig a little deeper, they're also pretty successful in other areas of their life as well. So that's kind of going off on a tangent here. Let's first get started. Of course, we begin every episode of Training Cafe with coffee. Let's sip together because one of the goals of Eric Hurst's Training Cafe is for us uh, globally to kind of commune with coffee because climbing is a passion we share and perhaps coffee is a passion we share as well. A um, couple of things here. First of all, uh, this episode's shout out. Um, Stefano Gustolfi, an Italian climber uh, who I've not met or talked with in person. I've seen him climb in person at a World Cup event a couple of years ago. Uh, and of course, he's one of the very best climbers, one of the few to have climbed uh, 515C. Just yesterday, released a video of his ascent of change. It's the Adam Andra route at Flatanger, which when Adam did it was the world's first 515C. The route has been unrepeated until this year when Stefano did it, uh, I think in September. But they've put together, uh, he and uh, Sarah Grippo put together a, a wonderful video kind of telling the story, uh, how uh, you know he kind of set this goal and there were obstacles that uh, came up beginning with the COVID lockdown in the spring and then uh, you know traveling to Norway to work on the route. Uh, is, of course, a, a great distance from Italy. Um, and then he was trying to compete in the World Cup and qualify for the Olympics, which he kind of got kind of gypped out of because of COVID. Uh, you know, his last chance to qualify was canceled. And, and while he is, in my opinion, definitely one of the 20 best climbers in the world and, and should be on that Olympic stage, it, it just didn't happen. And so he, uh, you know, refocused his goals and uh, decided, you know, he was going to go back to flat anger and try to um, take care of the route change, uh, do the second ascent. Uh, and he did that in September, despite poor conditions, you know, the route having wet holds and the weather not being ideal. He still got it done. And so it's a beautiful video that was released. At, I think it's on Epic TV, uh, I guess, on YouTube and uh, 8 a uh, Dot NU just uh, posted it, and I'm going to post it on my Training for Climbing site because it's a nice story about facing adversity and you know pursuing your goals 
Um, and uh, it's always easy to make excuses ahead of time or you know, to give a half-hearted effort when things aren't kind of teed up perfectly for you. But Stefan is a real pro and he overcame those obstacles and sent the route anyway. So I really encourage you to watch that video. It's, it, it's um, inspiring to say the least. Uh, two more announcements before we uh, move on. Uh, number one, we have a year-end sale at fizzyvantage.com. It's a buy three proteins, get one free. So if you buy three supercharged collagen, you'll get one free. Uh, or if you buy you know, two whey proteins and two collagens, you'll get one of the four free. So it's a terrific year end sale where basically you get 25% off your purchase. You stock up on your protein needs to accelerate recovery and support tendon strength and muscle recovery and muscle strength. Uh, these are products that I use daily. The clients I work with use daily and a growing number of pro climbers and amateur climbers use daily uh, around the United States and actually even in Europe and Australia and Asia where we ship product as well, though we don't have uh, official distribution in those areas just yet, only our website. Um, and the second announcement is uh, I'm going to be one of uh, a dozen presenters in the Performance Climbing Coach Virtual Summit. It's kind of an all-day event being held in January, uh, though you can view the videos on demand at your leisure. Uh, and there's a tremendous list of presenters. Uh, it, it, you know, it's been organized by Climbstrong, which is Steve Bechtel's event, and a few of his coaches, Charlie and Chrissy and Alex are participating, uh, Tyler Nelson, uh, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Chris Hampton from uh, Power Company, uh, Dr. Jared Baji, uh, and uh, myself. You know, I'll be one of the speakers uh, doing a talk. I had planned on doing a one-hour talk, and I, I just recorded it the other day. It turned into two hours uh, on energy system training, probably the deepest drill down yet on energy system training and how you can use it to... Um, uh, target your weaknesses more effectively, get better results out of your training, um, and even adjust your training to match a project that you are planning to work on uh, in the near future. And so it's a, a powerful topic, not really beginner topic, but if you're a more advanced or elite level climber, then energy system training is a conceptual model that can really add to your effectiveness uh, and um, help you design your training programs to be more effective. So check that out. Uh, if you go on to Instagram or even just Google performance climbing coach seminar or something like that, you'll get into the website and be able to see uh, and read more about the event and sign up uh, for the course. So check that out. Okay, so let's move on to today's topic and hopefully the audio is working here okay. Um, uh, and the Wi-Fi is holding up. Uh, give me a few minutes here just to kind of do a little bit of instruction with you, and then I'll get on to, I see a bunch of questions answered here. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, get to uh, a fair number of them in this episode. But again, I'm going to have another Trading Cafe next Monday. So if I don't get to your question today, then please come back next Monday and be first in line. Okay, um, so Today, I guess I want to talk a little bit about um, wrapping up the year and setting your sights on the new year. And then in the next uh, training cafe, I'll talk more about specific tips and things you can do to train and act more effectively in, in 2021. Now, 2020, um, unfortunately, brought us a, I guess you could call it a black swan event in the form of this COVID-19 pandemic that uh, spread around the globe from China and uh, reached the United States here um, and really hit hard beginning in March. And so for myself and for most people in the United States, uh, it was kind of a normal start to the year until we got to around the second week of March. And then the lockdowns hit, the climbing gyms closed. And for many of us, travel was not possible. Uh, myself, we were locked down here uh, in our home in Pennsylvania for basically 10 weeks, you know, until June 1st. And so we had no spring climbing season and, uh, you know, 
were stuck in at home training mode. Now I'm blessed to have a great at home training facility, uh, but still it wasn't what we had planned, but um, you know, we were able to weather the storm and nobody in my immediate family got sick from COVID. And actually, you know, I was looking for ways, you know, trying to be the optimist to turn lemons into lemonade. And one of those ways was training cafe. This was born out of COVID-19, uh, you know, not being able to travel and meet climbers and talk training in person. I thought, hey, why not, um, in addition to my monthly podcast, why not do a weekly or every other week video where I can instruct and engage um, and commune with coffee with uh, climbers around the world. And so Training Cafe was born out of COVID-19. So that's kind of one way I made lemonade out of lemons. And the other uh, interesting thing that, I, I, you know, thinking back, I am blessed to have is you know, my sons were locked down in the house with me. So instead of my uh, young son being off to school or to college this year, he was studying at home. And um, my older boy, Cameron, who's been a traveling climber, a pro climber for uh, two years now, he was locked down at home. And again, while not ideal uh, for us to be together uh, training um, and having uh, time kind of locked up together was um, a, a unique opportunity because they're both kind of moving on and growing up and you know my wife and I are becoming empty nesters so you know that was kind of interesting for the four of us to be here uh, together training and kind of hanging out um, and uh, trying to invest the time as as wisely as we could uh, in terms of training and just you know working on other projects and other things you know um, for me my business is advantage went on and continued to grow this year despite COVID. Uh, and, um, you know, so the lockdown uh, enabled me to really work hard on that. And so, again, I am um, an eternal optimist and always looking for ways to turn adversity into something um, that I can leverage in a positive way. Um, and so, you know, reflecting on the year, uh, it was a, a rough first six months, but then uh, I did get to climb and travel some this summer. And uh, this fall, I set my hardest climb perhaps ever. So uh, for me being an older climber of uh, 44 years uh, to do my hardest climb ever was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of gives me um, hope and belief that maybe I could even take it to the next level in the next year or two. We will see about that. And so with regard to yourself, hopefully you also were able to, um, despite COVID, be able to you know, achieve some of your goals and plans for the year, though uh, perhaps it had to be rearranged. And I don't, I don't know of any climbers who were able to travel internationally. That was my plan, but did not happen. And hopefully it, it can happen in 2021. Um, but in, in any case, if you and your family have dodged COVID and not experienced the tragedy that many folks have, well, then I guess we have a lot to be blessed for uh, in the year coming to a close without worse impacts. Um, <clears throat> and I guess uh, just to set the stage for the next uh, training cafe where we'll talk more about goal setting and executing a game plan for reaching your goals. Maybe the one thing to think about between now and then is to start thinking about what are, or what is kind of, if there was one mega goal for 2021 for you, for your climbing, what would it be? Um, a trip, um, a route to send, a grade of climb to achieve, Think about that over the next week and you know, write it down. What would be that one mega goal for 2021? And that's kind of what you want to fix your course on uh, in setting your short-term training goals and game plan. Um, and I guess maybe you want to broaden it out and also come up with a uh, big goal or life event that you're hope will come to, together in 2021 as well. You know, maybe it relates to schooling or career or a relationship or family. Uh, because I am a big believer that 
we all need some balance in our life. And although we'll go through periods where, you know, we'll be more, you know, um, uh, engrossed and uh, entrenched in our climbing and our training, and then we'll have periods where maybe other things in our life take over and climbing is more on the side burner. Um, I, I think having that that balance in life is important, and I um, advocate that. Uh, you know, it's more healthy physically and mentally to have other things going on in your life. And so um, while you are, you know, pondering your climbing goals for 2021, why not consider goals in other areas of your life as well? And, uh, you know, write a few things down. And then in the next training cafe, I'll talk about building a system and, you know, give you some uh, tips that can hopefully help you reduce the clutter in your life. The distractions are a big thing because distractions uh, are dream busters and goal breakers uh, and really, uh, you know, the things in our life that are most distracting, most immediate to us, uh, whether it's people or things beeping at you, um, you know, that shiny object stealing your attention. Those really are kryptonite uh, in terms of you becoming the, the superman or woman you need to be to reach big goals in your life. Uh, and we'll talk more about that next Monday. Okay, so let's get on here to some of your questions. And hopefully I can give you some answers here. Let's begin with uh, Douglas. Been reading the How to Climb 512 book. Been climbing two years and recently created goals, tracked progress, and developed an approach to climbing with intention. I, I like that. Um, recently climbed 10C struggling to climb efficiently and endurance is an issue. Do I have a gym climbing drill to incorporate into winter training? Okay, this is a great question and um, exactly what I would expect from a climber of two years um, that is maybe trying to pursue the 512 grade or maybe if you're a boulder at that time, maybe pursuing V5, V6. And um, you mentioned efficiency and you mentioned endurance. And they, of course, go hand in hand. Because if you are not efficient in your movement, whether it's muscling through a crux move or just general inefficient movement up a, a route, a roped route, either way, um, it's an energy leak. It's kind of like a car having the engine out of tune and having a hole in the gas tank. And so you're leaking gas out of the gas tank and the engine's out of tune and you're not getting the miles per gallon and maybe even your tire pressure is low. So you have another thing robbing you of mileage and, and maybe you have a heavy foot on the gas and a foot on the brake, perhaps at the same time. So there's all these things going on to steal uh, efficiency from your car in that analogy. And uh, climbing, it's the same way. And so for a climber of two years, I would ask you to kind of consider a variety of things. First of all, um, tension, just general tension as you climb. And oftentimes with young climbers, the tension grows as you ascend, you know, getting higher up the route. Um, both because of maybe fear factors, but also as fatigue grows, you start to overgrip and hang on even more. Uh, you know, and, and so that's largely a mental skill that needs to be built. How to um, lower arousal um, when you get to a rest, how to kind of reset yourself. If you look in the How to Climb 512 book or in my Training for Climbing book, there's a whole chapter on mental training and part of the, you know, um, some of the skills that I describe are skills that allow you to modulate your arousal and to kind of release tension that gathers on a climb. And so that will help partially reduce the energy drain and 
you know, inefficiency, but also um, the movements. Uh, I mentioned muscling through a crux move that might otherwise be kind of finessed with some body English, some twisting and turning. And those are um, movement skills that you can't learn in two years. It's kind of like, you know, let's use golf as an analogy. And my wife is a golf pro, so I, I know that sport pretty well. And, you know, you can learn to swing a golf club in a few weeks and learn to swing it pretty well in a year or two. But it's a very technical sport. And to get all the nuance down, to make all the shots can take a decade or more, or for me, a lifetime. Uh, and so, you know, climbing like golf is a very... Um, it seems to be intuitive sport, you know, quick to learn. Swinging a golf club and climbing a ladder, pretty simple skills. You can do it your first day, but uh, becoming really um, uh, effective and um, let's say even expert uh, at all the nuance takes, you know, many years. Uh, and so uh, you should feel good that with continued indoor climbing, and especially if you're climbing with some folks that are better than you, or if you work with a coach that can help you, uh, you know, when they see you muscling through a move on a boulder or route, say, hey, you know, why don't you try this? You know, why don't you try twisting your hip to the wall or, you know, doing a little bit of a dead point lunge instead of locking off, you know, learning to use momentum to get you through hard moves. Little tricks like that can save a tremendous amount of energy. And so um, in terms of drills, you asked me drills that you could do in the gym. Here's one, and then I'll move on to the next question. Um, when you climb a route near your limit that you feel you kind of did muscle up or strain through to get to the top, uh, once you do successfully climb it to the top, don't you know check it off in your mind and move on to the next route, but instead, climb the route two or three more times. Uh, so after that first ascent, you know, the first time you successfully make it up without hanging or falling, rest 20 minutes and climb the route again. And this time, think about grabbing the holds with a little less force. Uh, think about maybe moving a little more quickly from rest position to rest position because moving quickly through hard moves and moving on and off small holds more quickly is one way to save energy. Uh, and as you become more familiar with the route and with the sequences, you'll be able to move more quickly. And, and maybe the first time up the route took you 10 minutes. The second time might only take you eight minutes. The third time might only take you six minutes or whatever. You get the idea. You should be faster each time with the goal to move as quickly and precisely as possible from rest position to rest position. And then when you get to a rest position, feel free to linger and shake out and um, relax, catch your breath. Uh, and so you don't need to rush through the rests; Those you can enjoy. But when you're climbing, climb briskly. And with each repeat on the route, you should be getting more efficient and more brisk and more confident. And even though Overall, you might be more fatigued by your third or fourth go on the route. You are becoming a more efficient climber. And that's one of the, you know, expert skills is that as you get fatigued to being able to kind of float up a route uh, with optimal efficiency. And so climbing a route more than once uh, with the goal of becoming more efficient and quick and precise with each successive repeat on the route is a great training technique. And it amazes me how few people in the gym do it. You know, they're obsessed on just ticking off routes or boulders. And why not, as a method of spinning up your climbing skill and becoming more efficient at climbing and getting more endurance in the process, why not uh, treat the route as a kind of a gymnastics routine? You know, think of a gymnast or an ice skater repeating a route over and over to kind of perfect the movement. Um, and that will um, help you become a, a more efficient and more expert climber. Okay, so a long question to a short answer, but that's what it takes sometimes. Um, 
Uh, and a follow-up from Doug, uh, what safe harbor routes do you recommend? Well, if 12A is your grade, well, then a route called Wonderama I would get on. Uh, that's kind of a home area that I developed and bolted 30 years ago that has become wildly popular here. Um, pretty amazing because it's basically a Pennsylvania road cut, but it's got some pretty good climbing. Okay, what do you think about Burden of Dreams? Who makes the second ascent? I am not exactly sure what that route is. Perhaps something at Flat Anger since I was talking about that, but I'm, I'm sorry I can't um, comment on that. Not familiar with it. Um, question about deadlifts. What typically would you advise I work towards? I'm uh, around body weight, deadlifting body weight now. With 25 years of training history, I feel like I could work up to one and a half times body weight. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, uh, the whole topic of deadlifting for climbers has really um, become a popular subject to talk about. And, you know, I've advocated this and myself and my sons, we do a little bit of deadlifting. Um, uh, of course, I'm always quick to point out climbers should not be getting involved in powerlifting or CrossFit or bodybuilding workouts. I mean, you can if, it, if you find it enjoyable and if that is more important to you than climbing harder. But um, you don't want to be on those types of programs if climbing your best is your goal. Um, you, you know, climbers, we want to develop a high strength to weight ratio, a high power to weight ratio. So we want to seek adaptations that make us stronger without gaining muscle mass. Okay, a pound or two in your climbing muscles, like your arms and your lats, shoulders, not a problem. But if you're packing on muscle in your glutes and your quads and your pecs and you know, elsewhere, if you're getting big hulking arms, that's not the body for climbing your best. Um, and so when it comes to deadlifting, you must be careful. Some folks, their genetics are such that if they do any weightlifting with their lower body, you know, whether it's squats or deadlifts or whatever, they will put on weight. And if that's you, well, then probably you don't want to do deadlifting. That being said, most people with more typical genetics, uh, people that aren't maybe so fast twitch, like myself, uh, can do a little bit of deadlifting and gain strength without putting on much weight, if any weight. Uh, and the protocol to do that is low reps uh, and high weight. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, if you, for someone who's new to deadlifting, you might begin with just one half of your body weight for the initial workouts. It is a technical lift. You, you, you know, um, want to seek some instruction or at least watch some YouTube videos to get the basics, uh, of proper deadlift form, uh, start off light and learn the lift and then work towards body weight and perhaps as high as one and a half times body weight. Uh, that is a good goal. Um, my sons can deadlift two times their body weight. At one point, I could deadlift two times my body weight. But it almost felt like I was risking injury as an older climber. And, you know, the rule number one of Eric's train club is don't get injured. And so I, I cut that back and I felt it wasn't the risk wasn't worth the reward that I could deadlift at one to one and a half times my body weight and get what I needed out of deadlifting. Um, and uh, the program I recommend is uh, a training weight that you can lift for uh, three to five reps and do just two or three sets at that training weight. Uh, do one warm up set at one half or maybe two thirds of your training weight. So for me, my training weight uh, currently is around 180 pounds. My body weight is 160 pounds. Uh, so my warm-up weight is, I guess, um, currently around 135 pounds. And so I'll, I'll, I'll put on the warm-up weight and do seven or eight reps. Uh, and then rest a few minutes, and then I'll do two or three sets at my training weight. And that's it. And for me, that gives me that uh, training of the posterior chain that is very important for uh, contributing to core stiffness on hard moves, whether it's boulders or routes, you need to be able to create core stiffness to connect hands and feet. 
And, you know, climbers tend to obsess on anterior core training, you know, things that, you know, work, um, you know, core stiffness in the front of your body, but we need posterior chain stiffness as well. And deadlifting is one of several exercises you can do for that. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so how can I maintain long endurance and short endurance when I'm doing strength? And can I mix up endurance training? Okay, well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, endurance is kind of on a continuum. You have kind of strength and power endurance, which is exercises or climbing where you're doing very hard, basically all out movements for 30 to 60 seconds. That's like classic power endurance. And then the longer endurance, which is more aerobic in nature, where you're climbing um, at a much lower power level, but working hard for two, three, four, five minutes or more, uh, which is you know really the stuff of route climbing. Um, and so when you do a strength training block, say in the winter where you're training finger force, you know your maximum grip strength and similar exercises. In the old days, we would say, oh, we'll just do a training block of strength and power and, you know, don't worry about endurance for the for a month or two while you spin up your strength and power. But we now know better that, uh, and I'm a firm believer, that it's endurance is something, especially if you're a route climber, you want to maintain year round. And so even during a kind of off season or winter season strength training, power training block, I do think you should be doing one or two endurance sessions per week. And what I would recommend is to do one session that is more kind of that classic power endurance, like bouldering four by fours or um, Frenchy French style pull-ups or repeaters on a hangboard, things that train that power and strength endurance for up to a minute of high power output and then do one more aerobic endurance or long endurance session per week, which is would involve route climbing in a gym if possible. Um, it's a little more challenging to train that aerobic endurance on a home wall, but you could do circuits. They would have to be very submaximal where you're only getting a light to moderate pump and you're climbing for three to five minutes at a time. And that would train uh, the oxidative system preferentially and help maintain adaptations, you know, mitochondria density, the oxidative enzymes. Uh, it would, you know, get the circulatory system engaged so you don't lose capillary density during a long block of strength training. Um, and so doing, uh, you know, one of those workouts per week, you know, a short endurance and a long endurance session per week, in addition to two or three of your strength and power uh, sessions would help you um, hopefully get gains in strength and power and maintain your endurance so that you can then transition into performance season um, a better climber than before. Okay, regarding mind and technique. Ten, um, Mario says he tends to overgrip on on sighting. Yeah, um, it, he's wondering if he, you know, is projecting, doing too much projecting, um, uh, you know, an attempt to push the grade um, has made him a less efficient on-sighter. And yeah, that's possible. I mean, uh, on-site climbing is really uh, a, a skill, a, a mental skill, because you know, being able to read uh, a sequence um, and react quickly and intuitively, you know, is 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 key and kind of that intuition when you're in the middle of a crux move, you know, should I lunge this move or try to do it statically? And, you know, that intuition just comes through massive experience. And so if you do spend most of your time projecting and only rarely on site, well, then you're not gaining much on site knowledge. Um, and, um, and whereas, you know, projecting a route, you're building a map. Uh, you're solving the puzzle and building this detailed blueprint for action that you follow and execute every time you go up the route. So it's kind of like letting, 
you know, your car GPS guide you through a complicated course or through a city, um, uh, as opposed to you trying to figure it out yourself um, and having to memorize landmarks and turns and, you know, kind of intuit what is appropriate given various traffic patterns. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, you know, there's been a study done on uh, cab drivers in London where they looked at the brains. They did MRIs, you know, functional MRIs of the brain and how the brain uh, works and lights up during cognitive tasks uh, on cab drivers in London, uh, those who use GPS exclusively to guide them to their destination and those who kind of get to know the city and all the nuance of the city and learn to uh, navigate through the city without GPS. And the brains of those cab drivers that use GPS versus not are different and behave differently. And that's, that's just evidence that, you know, all of our experiences uh, of in our life and all the problem solving, uh, you know, wires our brains uh, uh, and conversely, if you're just a, a, a project, you know, red point climber, where you solve the puzzle slowly and just build this blueprint for success, uh, your brain is being wired maybe to be successful at that, but not at on sighting. And so uh, I know a lot of pro climbers who, um, while they are known for their hard red points, 515, whatever, as training, you know, uh, um, and also as value, do on sighting and uh, feel that it's quite important to them. Uh, and I, I know Chris Sharma, uh, you know, his MO was to either seek out on sites, routes he could do first try, you know, maybe he was trying to on site 14A, 14B, or project. 14D, 15A, 15B, whatever. And he didn't do a lot in between, like routes that you would do in a few goes. Um, it was either on-site or project. Um, and I don't know what the ratio would be. I think for people learning to climb and wanting to get better, the ratio should be more like 80% on-site or second go type climbing and 20% projecting. Um, but a lot of climbers, it's the other way around, um, which, you know, putting more time into projecting is the way to send harder routes, but it's not the way to become a better climber. I feel strongly about that. So, yeah, going forward, uh, Mario, maybe you want to think about adjusting your numbers and commitment there. Um, and uh, you will train your brain accordingly. Okay, looking for power gains, first two stages, coordination, synchronization. Percentage, do you think our grade can improve just? Yeah, that's hard to say. Um, yes, uh, when you do power training, you know, campus training, uh, or, you know, do powerful boulders uh, and such, you know, one of the short, you know, quicker adaptations does relate to the nervous system, recruiting and synchronizing motor units and increasing your rate of force development. And you can get uh, power gains in the course of a few workouts to a few weeks from that. Uh, how that translates to grade of climb, you know, maybe it would get you one grade harder at bouldering. Um, on sport climbing, it's hard to say whether there would be a big difference or not, uh, but a more powerful muscle is more efficient on submaximal moves. So you can certainly benefit as a rock climber as well. Uh, now, long-term, those uh, nervous system type adaptations, you know, they don't go on forever. Uh, and those longer term adaptations, actually we have come to discover relate more to connective tissue, um, developing stiffer tendons, the extracellular matrix that runs through your muscle and gathers force from the contractile fibers and passes it on to the tendons and the bones. As you um, increase collagen density and collagen cross-linking and stiffen that system, you transmit the force more quickly and with a uh, less loss of power, less um, energy leak, you might say. 
Um, and so those are adaptations that take years, perhaps decades. Uh, and so um, uh, you shouldn't just stop power training when you think, well, I've gotten all the nervous system adaptations I can get. Uh, because uh, a commitment to long-term strength and power training is really what, that, what year over year will help you eke out those long-term gains. You know, you look at a pro climber who goes up one letter grade every year or two, and their body doesn't change much, if at all, from year to year. But what does change is their brain, obviously. You know, they're more knowledgeable climber. Uh, they're presumably becoming a little more efficient in their movement each year, uh, but also their connective tissues. That is the one uh, adaptation, uh, perhaps more than any other physical adaptation that is uh, helping them become stronger and more powerful and efficient year over year. So uh, I'm not sure if I uh, answered your question or not, but hopefully gave you a little more insight into how that all works, at least as best as I understand it at this stage of the game. Okay, um, next question. I'm thinking of training only strength and power and endurance until two to three weeks before uh, climbing season starts and then only bring up power endurance then. Yes, that is exactly what I prescribe. Um, and based on my energy system conceptual model, I'm convinced that it's, at least for a more advanced climber, the best way to go these days. And so what you describe and what I advocate uh, for winter training is a more polarized approach to training for climbing, where uh, you're training the two ends of the power spectrum. Uh, the one end of the spectrum is high strength and power, near maximal movements uh, lasting five to 15 seconds. So that would involve, you know, a lot of limit bouldering, um, hangboard training, you know, max weight hangboard training, one arm hangboard training if you're elite, campus training, several different forms of campus training. Those all seeking those strength power adaptations that target the um, alactic energy system. And at the other end of the uh, power spectrum are, are more low power activities that last a long time that are powered mainly by the aerobic energy system, the oxidative system. Both oxidative fast twitch fibers and those slow twitch fibers that are exclusively oxidative. And so that would involve training exercises that are um, submaximal, uh, lasting two to five minutes in duration, and uh, or perhaps longer, though I think um, exercises that are at an intensity of about eight out of 10 that get you moderately pumped but never out of breath, never acidy, never burning uh, intensely in your forearms, never getting near failure. Uh, and by kind of adjusting your climbing or your training to be in that zone, uh, you maximally recruit your aerobic energy system. You may slightly go into the lactic zone, but never deeply never to the point of creating uh, great intracellular acidosis, uh, never, again, climbing to failure. Um, if you did, you would be very lactic at that point. And that's not the goal. We're trying to be aerobic. And so I, I think you want to be right around that um, aerobic anaerobic threshold. Um, and hence, I, I term the training that you should be doing threshold training. Uh, again, two to five minute burns, then you rest for um, two to 10 minutes and repeat. Uh, and again, your goal is to avoid failure, um, get blood circulating, really recruit that uh, aerobic energy system uh, through various exercise protocols or climbing protocols that kind of get you in that zone. And it would take quite a while to describe the exercises uh, that are best suited for that, but you can uh, 
you know, read more in my Training for Climbing third edition book uh, or my Energy System podcasts. Uh, if you go back to my podcast from 2018, I did a series on Energy System where I really map out what exercises fit uh, each type of training. Um, and uh, as you uh, mentioned in your question, you only do that lactic training, that power endurance, strength endurance training. That's the real pumpy, painful training where you do get acidy. That is the last thing you train for the final two to four weeks before your performance block because the adaptations you get from that training, unique to that type of training, relate to um, anaerobic enzymes and lactate uh, transporters and buffering that will spin up in just two to four weeks. You don't need a long training block to spin them up. So you do that last right before you go into your performance climbing period. See how we're doing on time here. I want to try to wrap things up by one o'clock. So we've got about 10 minutes left here. Next question for shoulder internal rotation exercise with dumbbell. What's the maximum weight I should work towards? as to not gain muscle mass. Okay, well, first of all, I don't know that you would gain much muscle mass from you know, the rotator cuff muscles if you're really isolating them properly. They're small muscles you know, that form the rotator cuff. And although the surrounding muscles, you know, the deltoid and such are larger, the rotator cuff muscles are not. And so I, you're not gonna really hypertrophy them much. That being said, you don't need to go crazy on strength training. You want to load them. You know, loading is what makes the rotator cuff tendons dense and stronger and hopefully more injury resistance. Um, and I like to think about you want to train strength endurance in those muscles so that when you become fatigued on a climb or boulder, they, the rotator cuff muscles still are working as a group to maintain control of the joint and hopefully not... Um, you know, be able to resist some of the things that can be injurious. So uh, I like to train in a 15 to 20 rep zone for rotator cuff. Um, and so select exercise uh, resistance with a dumbbell. If you're laying on your side doing rotator cuff training, uh, for me, I warm up, okay, for external, first of all, internal rotation where you're pulling weight in, climbers are really strong at that because when you're pulling, doing pull-ups or climbing, you're doing a lot of internal rotation. Uh, the lat muscles even aid in internal rotation. And, and so you'll discover when you start training internal and external rotation, your internal rotation strength may be uh, twice that of external rotation. And so climbers, what we really need more of is strength in external rotation. Um, and so uh, for me, when I train internal rotation, I'm typically using a 25 pound dumbbell for 20 reps. When I'm doing external rotation, I warm up with a 10 pound dumbbell uh, and do 15 reps uh, or 15 to 20 reps. And then I uh, go up to a 15 pound dumbbell and do maybe two sets of 10 to 15 reps. Again, trying to stay in a more of a high rep zone to train strength endurance. And then for internal rotation, I'll typically just do one or two sets because again, when you're doing pull-ups and climbing, you are already strengthening the internal you know, rotation muscles. Um, so your goal should be more to strengthen the external rotation. How strong do you need to get? Not, not crazy strong. Um, and, and you won't find that you're gonna, you know, if you're using good form, for these muscles, you know, if you're really moving your elbow and arm around and, you know, trying to muscle movements, then you start to bring in these other muscles, the larger muscles to cheat on the exercise. But if you're really isolating properly and keeping your elbow fixed by your side so that you can just target the, the, the four rotator cuff muscles, you won't get, uh, you know, you won't get crazy strong, maybe up to 20 pounds on external rotation and maybe up to 30 or 40 pounds on internal rotation. I don't think you want to go heavy. That might even tempt injury perhaps. Um, but uh, if you haven't done this type of training, you will see some gains in strength. Uh, honestly, for me, I don't think my strength in external internal rotation has changed much in the last decade 
uh, nor do I think it needs to. If I can maintain the strength endurance, I can maintain the control and the health of that joint. I think more so you want to be strengthening the scapular stabilizers, which that's a whole other topic. It's a related muscle group for shoulder health and important, uh, but it's a separate group of exercises. Okay, um, to train aerobic endurance, I've been doing some low intensity repeaters, like 30%, just pulling on a portable hangboard on rest days. You know, that's fine. And uh, that's more just, you mentioned regeneration, or I often call it recovery training. If you're pulling at 20 or 30% of your peak finger force, you know, um, something you could do for many minutes in a row and not get pumped at all. That's pure aerobic training. Um, and it's sub maximal aerobic training, which, um, is often referred to as arc training. The idea you could go to a gym and just traverse for 20 minutes and not get pumped. So you'd be on really good hand and foot holds and be really low intensity and just working on movement and, you know, circulation. And it would be essentially a muscle recovery workout, but you're not training up the aerobic energy system with that type of low intensity training. And here's why, because you're only calling in a percentage of mitochondria uh, and you're not hitting the muscle with full circulatory um, conducta, uh, conductance, uh, you know, the vascular conductance is a fraction of its maximum. And so that type of exercise isn't enough to warrant the body adapting upward. And so it is just a recovery type workout. Um, uh, could be beneficial to connective tissues because it is some added loading, which gets some fluid flow in and out of the connective tissues. That could be beneficial. So um, I think for recovery and, and certainly in rehabilitative situations, you know, where you're maybe have a pulley injury you're coming back from, I think that type of low load training is great. But for a fit, healthy climber seeking to take their aerobic power to the next level, that type of training isn't going to do it. You need to do the threshold training that I talked about a little while ago, where you are really maxing out the aerobic energy system. And the only way to know you're maxing out the aerobic energy system, maxing out, you know, the mitochondria, you know, those factories that make ATP to really have them working at their limit. The only way to know you're working them at the limit is to actually cross over into the bottom of the anaerobic lactic zone. And you know you are there when you do start to get uh, that pump that um, begins to signal fatigue. Um, and maybe just the slightest burn that begins to signal hydrogen ion accumulation and pH drop inside the cell. Um, and so you begin to taste that lactic zone. And if you can have the awareness and discipline to not go deep into it, but to hover right in that, you know, you kind of find that sweet spot right where the aerobic system is maxed and the lactic system is beginning to contribute. That's the training zone for meaningful adaptations of the aerobic energy system. Um, but 30%, um, uh, you know, uh, very low intensity type training isn't going to get you there. Ooh, um, I lost my spot here. And I see so many questions here that I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to get to all of these today. Um, okay, where were we at here? Let me see if I can blow through a few more here before we wrap things up. Uh, Matthew, if I uh, do a hangboard session in the morning, do you have a recommended type of climbing session I should do in the evening? Uh, keep it endurance or easier. Well, first of all, what is your hangboard session? You know, is it a um, max strength protocol, weighted hangs, let's say, for instance, or minimum edge hangs? Uh, and if so, if you do that in the morning, then definitely in the evening, I would do either a more of a 
you know, strength endurance or power endurance, like a four by four bouldering workout, uh, or you could even do an aerobic, you know, threshold type endurance session. Um, now, if your morning hangboard session is something like repeaters, doing 20 sets of repeaters, which is more strength endurance training, um, then your afternoon session, uh, you know, you could do some route climbing or you could do some threshold. I, I, I probably threshold training would be uh, a good choice. Um, but I don't think there's a benefit in like just repeating the exact same workout. Uh, very often, if you're doing two a days, you're thinking about doing more of a, a strength power in the morning and then a strength endurance or aerobic endurance in the evening, or even doing a, a climbing workout for the one workout. And then the second workout of the day being an antagonist session or even a generalized aerobic session, like going out for a run. Or you could flip that. Sometimes I'll do the run in the morning and then the climbing session in the evening. So two a day training is a, a great tool for a more advanced climber. But again, you got to program it properly um, and try to get at minimum four hours rest between the sessions, ideally six hours and some protein and carbohydrate in between as well. <clears throat> okay, your opinion on hangboard protocol by Tyler Nelson, one arm max pull isometrics, uses one hand in the position you want to train and pull as hard as you can for four seconds, rest one minute times four. Um, I, I mean, uh, isometric training is a great uh, tool to have in your toolbox for maximum strength type training. Um, it, you know, uh, strength is specific to a specific arm angle or grip. So if you know that you have a weak uh, grip position, like if you're weak at open hand grip or if you're weak at lock off, to do some isometric training in that um at that angle, that position is beneficial. So yeah, I think it's a, a totally fine um, uh, max strength training tool to go to. Um, you can't just train that way and only that way, but it is uh, one tool to have in the toolbox. Okay. Um, oh, thank you, uh, Griffin. Yeah. It says, can't wait for this year to be over. I, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way, especially if they had a up close and personal run in with uh, COVID. Um, what's your daily diet consist of? Well, um, I am a fairly strict on my diet, but also allow uh, cheat events that often involve like cake and coffee or coffee and cookies. Uh, you know, I enjoy that type of thing not in large doses and not daily, but um, I do think uh, there's no food that we need to completely deny ourselves of. That being said, we are participants in a strength to weight ratio sport, and it's not an eat anything you want kind of sport. I, 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 I'm fond of pointing that out because there are sports that are known that people can eat as much as they want and get away with it, and climbing is not one of those sports if you wanna take it to your limit. Um, my diet, uh, morning breakfast is almost always oatmeal. Um, that's one of the best morning foods. I believe a lot of pro climbers are oatmeal eaters, uh, and, um, uh, mid morning, a banana. Um, I am a coffee drinker. I am a protein shake drinker. So I also, along with my morning oatmeal, have a, a whey protein shake. Um, my choice way, of course, is a fizzy vantage weapons grade way, which is brilliant mixed in skim milk or water. I consume it both ways. Um, and then uh, for lunch, uh, oftentimes uh, an energy bar, a protein bar. Um, I enjoy protein bars. Um, yeah, they're not the ideal food. If you could make a healthy small meal for lunch, that would be probably better than a protein bar, but I'm a busy person and lead an active life. And so a cup of coffee and a protein bar is um, a, a good, you know, lunch. Uh, some days at the Crag, I have a, a bagel sandwich, peanut butter and jelly bagel sandwich, which really works well for me at the Crag. Perhaps another piece of fruit during the afternoon. Um, and then my biggest meal of the day is my dinner. Uh, I'm a, a big fan of kind of carbo backloading which is where I consume most of my carbohydrate and therefore most of my calories at dinner. Um, and so uh, very commonly 
a, a big plate of pasta, some vegetables, some red sauce, sometimes uh, a clear like uh, olive oil type sauce with garlic, um, salad with uh, spinach salad. Um, but I uh, often eat a late dinner around 8 p.m. because I, I do a late workout most days between 5 and 7 p.m. or 6 and 8 p.m. And so that carbo backloading is a meal right after my uh, workout is done. Um, and then a bedtime protein shake uh, because muscle protein synthesis while you sleep is a big deal if you want to recover quickly. And so to anchor that or support that with 30 grams of high quality protein, again, I use the weapons grade whey, is very, very effective. Uh, for hard training climbers, for older climbers, for sure. Um, and just for connective tissue adaptations, it is important to get enough protein. Um, I didn't mention pre-workout. I do uh, supercharged collagen pre-workout to get the collagen specific amino acids into my system before I load the tendons. That is the research proven strategy to support tendon health. Um, more on that, a different episode. Maybe we'll circle back to that this winter. Um, and boy, I am past one o'clock and I'm sorry that I see a lot of questions here on energy system training on four, three, two, one program training. Um, my use of sauna, uh, you know, so many good questions here. Maybe I can screen capture these and get to them next Monday. I, again, apologize, but let me see if I can screen capture these and give these questions preference next Monday when we meet again. Um, and so uh, I guess it's time to sign off and wish you a happy New Year's. If you're still nursing a coffee, we can commune together one more time. And uh, wishing you a uh, safe and happy New Year's. Um, perhaps like me, you'll just be spending it at home uh, because uh, many of us are on a COVID lockdown or restrictions of sorts <laughs> and uh, don't want to be in any large gatherings. Uh, but we will all meet again here uh, next Monday at noon Eastern time. Please tell your friends and climbing partners about Training Cafe so they can join in as well. And uh, I'll try to leave, you know, a good block next Monday to hopefully get to these questions first and any new questions that are submitted at the start of the episode next week. So uh, Eric Hurst signing off for now. We'll see you next Monday. Have a good New Year's.